37 tonight. Psalm chapter number 37. And we're not going to read the whole psalm tonight. It's 40 verses, but we're going to do about half of it tonight. And we'll finish with it next week. Um, it's, a, it's a great psalm. It's a, another psalm of David. Um, David is again reminding us of whom our focus should be on. And uh, that is the Lord. And he's going to remind us of that in the first eight verses. And then uh, he's going to let us know uh, what happens to those who choose uh, the life of wickedness and, and a life that is away from God and separated from God. And so uh, tonight we're going to read the first 22 verses and we'll dive right in. The Bible says, Fret not thyself because of evil doors, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down like the grass and withered as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as thy light, and, the ju and thy judgment as the new day. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself, because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger, and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be, yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall, des shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plotteth against the just, and gnasheth upon him with his teeth. The Lord shall laugh at him, and he see uh, for he seeth that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn out the sword, and hath bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, and to slay such as be of upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart, and their bowels shall be broken. A little that uh, a little that a righteous man hath is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time, and in the days of famine they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke, shall they consume away. The wicked borroweth and payeth not again, but the righteous sheweth mercy and giveth. For such as be blessed of him shall inherit the earth, and they that be cursed of him shall be cut off. That's great. Dear Holy Father God, tonight we just come before you, God. We ask that you bless the reading of your word. God, help me tonight as I teach and preach, God, from your word. God, just hide you behind the cross. God, give me the words to say. Help me recall what I study. In Jesus' name pray. Amen. And so when we look at this psalm, uh, it's really broken into four parts. And so tonight we're going to go through the first two parts, and then next week we'll finish off with the last two parts. And uh, the first part of this psalm that we see is that we should have a focus on the Lord, a focus on the Lord. The first thing I see is that when you focus on the Lord, you will focus less on the bad things going on around you. Look at verse number 1. It says, Fret not thyself because of evil doers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. When you get your eyes off of the, the, the evil doers and you don't fret yourself, that means to really irritate yourself, to, to stir yourself up. And when, when you focus less, you get upset less, you get irritated less because of the things going on around you and you focus more on Jesus, your life goes a lot better. Uh, you know, it, and that's that's a thing that's really hard for us to do because we know what's right and what's wrong. But when we focus so much on what's wrong with with the world that we lose sight of Jesus Christ, we're focusing on the wrong thing. You know, I don't believe that this means that we shouldn't be upset and sit back and watch. I don't believe that that's what the Bible is telling us to do. But rather, we should focus on Jesus more, more than the problems of the world, more than the iniquities going on more than evil doers, but we should focus on Jesus more than all of that. Instead of focusing on it for ourselves, we should give it to Jesus and focus on Him. 
God deserves our focus. God deserves every bit of our attention. And when we're so, uh, so distracted by the things of the world that we lose sight of Jesus Christ and, and who He is and, and what He has done for us, we've lost it. We've lost it. We really have. When we're so focused on what we heard on the news that we forget about what Jesus said, we've lost it. And I know that we, we live in a wicked, wicked world. We do. But there's been wickeder times. We think about the days of Noah. There's never been a day like the day of Noah. And, and yet, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, right? And, and why was that? It's because he was perfect in his generation. He was upright in his generation. He did what he should be doing. He was living a godly life. And we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper in that later on. But, but we need to be so focused on Jesus that we, we lose sight of the other things. And then, it's, then the Bible says, I'll be envious. We shouldn't desire what the workers of iniquity have. Uh, a lot of times we hear things like, why do good things happen to bad people? And it's true. Good things do happen to bad people. You know, you think about the, the people who uh, have the nicest houses and the nicest cars and, and all those things. And, and we look at them as, from our worldly perspective, and say, man, they sure have a lot. They have a lot of things going for them. They have the nicest house. They have the nicest car in the neighborhood. But they're missing the most important thing, and that's Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. They can have all of that. They can take all the world. They can have all the nice cars, all the nice things. And they can have all the nice houses. And they can take all of that and give me Jesus. Because Jesus is the most important thing. We should focus less on what they have and focus more on what we have, and that's Jesus Christ and salvation. That's the greatest thing that we could ever have. It is the greatest gift that could ever be given. And it's, it's worth far more than any of those other things. And so we should be envious of what others have. When we focus on what they have, we miss out on what we have, which is salvation and a home in heaven. I'm thankful tonight that no matter what kind of car I drive or what kind of house I live in, that God still gave me salvation and it was free. And that I, I can't do anything to work for it. And I can't do anything to keep it. But by God's grace, He's given us salvation. And He keeps us in His hand. Then why? Why do we need to not focus on, on the things that are going on around us? Why does it not matter? Because we know that God is going to cut them down. We think about uh, when you go out and you're pushing your lawnmower. And if you look in front of your lawnmower, the grass looks really good. But when you get and you lower your lawnmower too low to the ground and you push your lawnmower, uh, the grass turns from green to brown because you cut it off. You cut the nutrients out. You've, you've destroyed your lawn. And that is what God is telling them is going to happen to them. He's going to cut them down like grass. And then it says uh, in verse number two, and wither as a green herb. How many of you have ever grown your own herbs around your house? You know, you got your basil or, or your parsley or maybe cilantro, one of, one of those type of things. And you go and you go out there and you cut it and you leave it on the counter to dry. And, and what happens? The green eventually turn, turns away from green if you leave it too long. And, and it dries up. And that's what God is going to do. He's going to cut them off. He's going to cut them down and they're going to wither as green herbs. So what they have now doesn't matter because it's going to all be burned up. Mm -hmm. Amen. What we have now doesn't matter because it's all going to be burned up outside of our salvation. At the end of the day, our salvation is far better than anything that the world has to offer. Amen. Then we see that when we trust in the Lord and do good, we will be fed. When you get your focus off others and on Jesus, it's a lot easier to trust Him because you see how well He's taking care of you. How many of you have ever noticed that when you're, when you're looking away from Jesus, it's, it's really easy to get discouraged. It's really easy to, to just get uh, in your feelings and get tied up in what others have. And Well, I don't have as, as good as this person. Well, guess what? When you get your focus on Jesus, all those things fade away. And you realize how good we have it. That we have it so good that someone, somewhere down the line, heard about Jesus and told someone else. And they told someone else. And they told someone else. And eventually it got to us. That we have it so good we can trust in the Lord. When we think about the, the phrase being fed, it, it's not a literal feeding. It's not literal food. But it's more of a, a figurative food. It's when you trust in the Lord, you get fed spiritually. You get fed spiritually. It takes food for anything to grow, right? 
Uh, if you want a, a plant to grow, you have to give it f water and, and oxygen and those things. And, and if you want it to grow really good, you, go, you put some miracle grow in there, don't you? And, and if you want your kids to grow, they start on milk and then they get meat and then they get strong meat. And so it's, it's just the way that life goes. And so if you want to grow spiritually, you have to grow your faith, right? And how do you grow your faith? You grow your faith by trusting in the Lord even when it's hard. I heard a preacher say, I was listening to a message a few days ago, he said, sometimes it takes God leading you into a storm to learn that you can trust Him. That's good, isn't it? And sometimes it takes God leading us into a storm to learn that we can trust Him. We think about the disciples on, this, on the Sea of Galilee in, in Luke chapter 8. Jesus said, hey, I know that we've been, we've been busy all day long. I've been telling all these parables. I've been telling all these stories that have heavenly meaning for earthly people and earthly meaning. And, and you know, it's a parable. It's about Jesus. And, and there's, a, there's a heavenly meaning to every one of these stories. And so we've been telling all these stories. Now, how about we get in the boat and go across the sea? And so Jesus invited them into the boat. And think about this. Jesus invited them into the boat knowing that there's a storm that was going to happen. Think about that just for a moment. You know, the disciples, they were about to get a lesson in faith. And Jesus had been giving parables about faith all day long, but they were about to get a real lesson in faith. Jesus invited in the disciples into the boat and left the multitudes there on the shore watching. And then what did Jesus do? Jesus got in the boat and he was tired because if you read any commentary, the reason he, was, he, he went to sleep is because he was tired. He was a human and he needed sleep, and so he went to sleep. And then the disciples woke, woke him up because they were sore afraid. They, were, they believed that they were going to die. Right? One of the accounts says that they truly believed that they were going to die. So they wake up. Jesus said, Master, cares thou not that we perish? And so Jesus gets up and he tells the storm to peace, be still. And, the, and guess what? The seas were calm. The storm goes away. And then what happens? Then they go and they meet the, the, the maniac at Gadara, the, right? They meet the, the man from the gathering sin. And what does Jesus do? He casts out the legion of devils. And so they learn that not only does Jesus have power over the elements during the storm, right? They, they learn that Jesus also had power over devils. And then if you keep reading, you find out that Jesus uh, was going to meet Jairus' daughter who was dead. Right? She was, she was dead. And Jesus said, no, she's not dead. She sleeps. And on the way there, there's this lady who had an issue of blood for 12 years. And she touched the hem of his garment and she was healed. So the, the disciples learned that Jesus had power over death and disease. And then they go on to Jairus' house. And, and, and Jesus, you know, everyone's sad. And they're, just, they're, they're really upset because this little girl had just died. And Jesus tells this girl to wake up. And guess what? She wakes up. They learn that Jesus had power over death. If the disciples never would have gotten into the boat, they would have missed the point of the parables. Right? The, multitude, the, the multitudes learned a bunch of stories that day. But the disciples learned about a Savior. And at the end of the day, the multitudes said, oh, what a story. But at the end of the day, the disciples said, oh, what a Savior. You know, sometimes the Lord leads us into storms so that we can learn how to trust Him. I'm thankful tonight that we, that we have storms in our life. Because if we didn't have storms, we wouldn't know peace. Right? If we didn't know bad, we, we, we couldn't know good. But I'm thankful tonight that Jesus allows us to go through things so that we can learn to exercise our faith. Then we think about this, when you delight in the Lord... He will give you the desires of your heart. I think this verse is probably one of the most misunderstood verses in the entire Bible. The Bible here is not saying that whatever you want, God's going to give you. If you just, uh, if you delight in the Lord. No, that's not at all what the Bible is saying. It's saying, but when you delight in the Lord, He's going to give you the desires of your heart because your desires become Jesus. Your desires become holiness. Your desires become the love of God. Your desires become to worship God. Your desires change. And so when, when the Bible says He will give you the desires of, the, of your heart, it's saying that you will desire Him more. You'll desire Him more for worship. You'll desire Him more for love. you desire to serve Him more. Spurgeon said this, He who fears God and His holy God's servant has no chains about Him. 
he may uh, he makes uh, live as he may live as he likes, for he likes to live as he ought. That's good, isn't it? When we think about the chains that we think hold us in bondage, no, there are no chains. The problem is we have a lot of rules, but we miss the most important part of the rules, and that's your relationship with Jesus Christ. The, the rules aren't there to chain us, right? The rules aren't there to tie us down. No, the rules are there so that we can desire a relationship with God more. The rules are guidelines, right? They keep us on the path. They keep us from straying away. They keep us from jumping ship. And so a, a lot of people, both Christians and non-Christians, see the Christian life as a bunch of rules that chain them to religion. But at the end of the day, it's a relationship with the Savior. And it makes the Christian life not a chore, but a privilege. When we think about delighting in the Lord and the desires of our heart, our desires should change the moment we get saved. We don't desire the world anymore. No, we desire Jesus. And the more that we learn about Jesus, the more we should desire Him. Right? It's not the opposite. We shouldn't desire Him less because of that. No, we should desire Him more. As Zephaniah calls us, we are indeed prisoners of hope. We are prisoners of hope, and the hope is Jesus Christ. Thankful tonight that He does give us the desires of our heart, but it's not the desires that the world might think we have. No, it's the worship of God, just the love of God. And it's us being allowed and, and permitted to serve God. Then the Bible says to commit your ways unto the Lord and trust Him, and then He will bring it to pass. The word commit here means to give and trust, to put into the hands of, or power of another, to entrust with. And so when we think about committing our ways to the Lord, the way here means your journey or the life that you live. So when you commit your life or you give and trust your life to the Lord, He will bring it to pass. So every trial that comes into your life, God is going to bring you through it. Every mountain that you have to climb, God is going to help you climb it. Every valley that you must go through, God is going to get you through the valley. You know, we think about all, all, all the way that we can live the Christian life, and a lot of times we miss out on the on, on the Christian life because we're so busy carrying our own baggage around. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. Cast all of it. Cast all your problems on Jesus. Jesus wants them. Jesus says, my burden, my burden is easy and, and light. And, you know, we think about... God wants to take our burden away, but we have this thing where we say, I surrender all but. I surrender all but. Insert your pet sin. Or insert something that you just say, you know, God doesn't care about it. No, God does care. God does care. He cares about everything that goes on in our life. Philippians 4, 6 tells us to be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. We, we shouldn't hold anything back, right? We shouldn't be anxious about anything. We shouldn't allow anxiety to cripple our lives. No, we should give what we have to God. And by prayer and supplication, we should have deep, earnest prayer to God. Whatever you face, God will bring it to pass. But you must be willing to give it over to God and allow Him to handle it. God will, God will take it, but you have to give it to Him, right? That, that's the hard part. Is letting go. But God says, let it go. I'll take it. I'll gladly bear the burden for you. Then when you give it all to Jesus, others will see his light in you. People are watching how we respond to adversity. People are watching how we respond to trials. People are watching us. And so the way that we be a light in the trial is by, is by showing that we trust in God. Showing that we are committed to God. We commit all of our life to God. Then the Bible says to rest in the Lord and wait for Him. There is rest from this wicked world, but it's only found in Jesus. You know, we, we live busy lives, everyone. It doesn't matter how young or how old you are. Everybody's life is busy. And I think back pre-COVID, I think our lives were even more busy. And so I think God sometimes has to slow us down. Because if, if we won't slow down, sometimes he has to intervene and slow us down. And I think, you know, there is rest found in Jesus. We just have to take the opportunity to rest. 
Rest is not a bad thing, even though uh, some people would say that rest is a bad thing. Yeah, I, sometimes I do believe that rest is a bad thing, but, but I, here's what I've learned. Rest is not a bad thing. It's okay. It's okay to sit down and rest and, and relax in the Lord. You know, we, we should not get lazy, right? And there's a difference between rest and laziness. You know, but, but there is time. I mean, Jesus rested, didn't he? God rested. He gave us, in the very creation of the world, He set us up to rest. But we have changed it. We've gotten away from it. We, we've decided that we need seven days to do work instead of six. No, that, that's not the biblical way. That's not what God intended for our lives. No, God intended for us to have rest. And so we should rest in Jesus. I believe that sometimes if we don't take the rest we need, God will make us take the rest. Find time to rest in the Lord. Just be silent in Him. That, that, that's the key. Just sit down and be silent in the Lord. Let Him speak. So often we have to speak. We have to have the last word. We have to be the one doing all the talking. You know, sometimes we've got to sit down and let God do the talking. Let Him talk to us. We should rest in the Lord. I think it's important to note the progression as we grow in the Lord. It starts with trust. We trust in the Lord. And then it moves to delight. Not only are we trusting in Him, but we find our delight. We find our happiness. We find our joy in the Lord. And then we commit to the Lord. We, we give Him everything that we have. We, we have learned that we can trust Him, that we can delight Him, and we can give Him everything that we have. And then it ends with rest. When you've done all three of those things, when you've trusted in God, you have committed to God, you have um, you, you have um, delighted in God, you can end with rest because you are living a life that has peace. The more we progress in the Christian life, the more trust we have in our Savior. It's like when we get married. Every day we, we should love our spouse more. Every day we should trust our spouse more. And, and so our, the Christian life is the same way. Every day we should trust Jesus more. We should love Him more. God can never love us any more than He ever has loved us. Like God's love is not going to be greater tomorrow than it was today. No, but our love for Him can be. And then it ends this, this portion of Scripture, this, this first part, with another, another time of telling them not to fret. Don't, don't worry about it. You know, I think that this is probably the hardest thing for all of us is not worry about what's going on in the world. Because we want to see the world saved. And I think... We have a passion for the world, but at the end of the day, we can only do our part. We can only do so much. At the end of the day, we have to get back to the singular focus, which is Jesus Christ. We shouldn't get upset when the wicked prosper because it's not going to act. It's not going to last very long, right? We should stop being angry. You know, some of the some of the meanest people I know are Christians. Some of the angriest people I know are Christians, and that's not the way it should be, right? We should be some of the happiest people. We should be some of the joyfulest people. We should be some of the nicest people that people meet because we have Jesus living inside of us. Amen. We need to stop being angry. We need to put the wrath behind. It says to forsake, to leave behind, to let it go. Forsake wrath. Don't allow the wicked to bother you. I think it's very hard Sometimes, but it's, it, it, I think it's hard because it's very easy to see what everyone else has and lose focus on what we have. The blessings that God has given us. When we think about our salvation, it's going to last forever. But when we think about what the wicked has, it's only temporary. All of it is going to burn up. No matter what, what they have, no matter what we have, at the end of the day, all we're going to have left is, is our salvation. Then we think about the result of wickedness. Here David is comparing the wicked versus the righteous. And so we see that evil doers will be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord will inherit the earth. Those who do not accept Christ as their sin will be eternally separated from God. They're going to be cut off from God. There's going to be nothing left. Those who do accept the Lord and wait on Him will inherit the earth. We know that Jesus reiterates this truth. And, and we'll see it reiterated again later on in the chapter. But in Matthew 5, 5, Jesus said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We have an inheritance that is far better than anything else that anyone could leave us. We have, a, we have a great inheritance. 
After a little while, the wicked will not be anymore, but the meek shall inherit the earth and have peace. One day evil will be no more. Amen. I'm thankful for that day. One day there will be no more sickness. There will be no more death. There will be, no be no more disease. There will be no more hurt. There will be no more pain. And, and one day that evil will be put away. Sin will be gone. But Jesus will remain. Like Philippians 4 talks about, there's going to be a peace that passeth all understanding. I'm thankful that there is peace found in Jesus Christ. And we see that the wicked will try to destroy the just, but the Lord will laugh because He knows their future. While the wicked plot against the righteous and gnash upon the righteous, that, that, uh, that will only last a little while as well. The word gnash means to rage, even to collision with teeth. To ground. So while they try their very hardest to destroy the righteous, Jesus is still on the throne and we will win. Amen. The Lord hates wickedness and one day he will rid the world of wickedness. The Lord laughs in derision at the wickedness. The Lord laughs because he, he knows what's going to happen. They think that they've won, but at the end of the day, Jesus Christ has won. Quickly, the wicked pull their sword to kill the poor and needy, but the sword will be used on them. The, the wicked are trying to kill the poor and the needy. They're trying to destroy those who do right and have the right conversation and live a Christian, live an upright life. But at the end of the day, that sword is going to be used on them. Right? Jesus will win. Verse number 16, I think, is a, is a key verse here. It says, A little that a righteous man hath is better than than the riches of many wicked. The little that we have is far better than what, what the wicked have. Uh, what many wicked have. I'm thankful tonight for my salvation. I'm thankful that I have a home in heaven. I'm thankful that I have the opportunity to live in America. That I could literally send, stand up here all night and tell you all the things that I'm thankful for. And all of that is a little. But at the end of the day, it's far better than what the world has. The arms of the wicked will be broken, but the Lord will uphold the righteous. God is going to hold us up while everyone around us is going crazy. God is still on the throne and He will lift us up. We know that God knows the very days of our life and is going to give us an inheritance. We will stand for God in the evil day. Even when there is famine in the land, we will find satisfaction in the Lord. Like I said earlier, we're living in some evil days today. We are. But there has been worse times. We think about the time of Noah, where every person did only evil continually. And, and what happened? It, it came before God, and God was God destroyed the earth because of the wickedness that was going on. Obviously, we haven't got to that matter. God would destroy the world, wouldn't He? Not with water, but with fire. He would call us home and destroy this world. So we know that there were days that were worse, but we see that the Bible calls Noah a just man and perfect in his generation. While the world around him was doing only evil continually, Noah was there serving God. What does that mean for us? That means that no matter how evil the day is, no matter how wicked the day is, at the end of the day, we can still serve Jesus because that is what we are called to. To do. If Noah can do it in that day, we can do it in this day. We see that the wicked shall perish and the enemies of the Lord shall be consumed by fire, the fat of the lamb. And you know what happens to fat when you, when you cook it over a fire? It goes away. It renders down. It, it is no more. And so God is going to destroy the wicked. The wicked are living on borrowed time. And they never repay. While the righteous live a life of mercy and are givers rather than takers. We should be givers rather than takers. In a, in a world that says, give me, give me, give me, we should say, take, take, take. God wants our life. Then we'll see in verse number 22, the blessed, in, the blessed inherit the earth and the curse of him are cut off. It is a good thing to be in the Lord. It's a good thing to be saved. We know that at the end of the day, that uh, our life is depending on the Lord. Our, our, all of our lives are dependent on the Lord. He has given us our salvation, and the, le the least that we can do is live for Him. That's the least that we can do. The easiest way to live a life of peace is to keep your eyes on Jesus 
and trust in Him to get us through this life. The end for the righteous is eternal life in heaven and inheritance beyond human comprehension, but the end for the wicked is eternal separation for God. I'll close with this and we'll be done. Instead of getting angry and distracted by the wickedness in the world, we should pray for them to get saved. That's, that's what God wants, that, right? That God is not willing that any should perish, but that, that all should come to repentance. And so if God is that way, we should be that way. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God, we're so thankful for this passage of Scripture, God. We're thankful for the focus that we should have, and that's you. God, help us to keep our focus on you, God. We're so thankful for your book, and God, help us as we enter into our prayer service, God. Just bless our time. Just your prayer. Amen. Amen. Does anybody